This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Resistance, different modes of resistance and problems with the notion of resistance. And then in the second part, I'll um, turn to some of the sort of smaller, finer work. Um, so I like to think of my work as a cross-fertilization of three different uh, approaches. So Anglo-American post-colonial theory, uh, French formalism, because I actually did my thesis in France, and 19th century, a sort of basically a new historicist approach. So those three approaches may sound incompatible uh, at first sight, but I hope to, I like to think that they're not. Uh, so in the first part where I'll be talking about resistance and notions of resistance, I will be linking it to a semi-personal narrative, partly to make it more entertaining and, and partly because um, I, I'm not ready to claim that I can talk about resistance as a whole and in an absolute. So when I'm thinking um, about my own whoops, claims to an original contribution to the idea of resistance, I like to remember Jane Austen's famous uh, quotation from her letters. She compared her work to painting with a fine brush on a little bit two inches wide of ivory. And uh, so I, I, I modestly like to think that I'm doing something like that myself. Of course, these days we wouldn't be painting on ivory, but maybe um, porcelain made in China or um, you know, ethically sound reclaimed wood or something. But the idea of painting with a fine brush compared to the broad brush vision is something that um, I'm particularly, well, I guess that's what I'm basing my work on. So the first part of what I'll say is the broad brush approach, and the second part will be the fine brush approach. I'll be discussing ideas of resistance in general, but turning quite quickly to the angle that interests me most, which is to do with colonialism, um, so just a specific area that's been particularly important in thinking about modes of resistance. So here we have a slightly random image that I couldn't resist showing you because these are garden gnomes of Karl Marx and uh, it has not very much to do with what I'm going to say but I, I just thought it was great. So when we talk about resistance, a lot of the vocabulary that we use is taken from Marxist theory. That's the connection with the garden gnomes. But I think actually what we're borrowing it from is a sort of idealized mid 20th century view of Marxism. And I can link this to my personal narrative because I was brought up in a household of that generation of radical Marxist, basically Marxist atheist feminist radical agenda of the 1970s. Um, so that's, that, was, that was where I'm coming from. And I, like I've been brought up Catholic, you can lapse and move on to other things, but I still know the words for all the songs. So it's in there still. But if you think about the short 20th century, this is all rather a long time ago now, and Marxism has been resoundingly shaken on a theoretical level, of course. And I'm thinking in particular of claims by Karl Popper arguing against Marxist scientificity, but also in terms of practical politics. So 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, so end of the Cold War, and of course, Tiananmen Square, um, which, is, which for me marks the end of a certain idealist approach to Marxism, naive Marxism, if you like. And then China turning to a socialist Marxist economy, you know, there's, there's no real Marxism around as far as I can see. And this is the last millennium, it's a long time ago. If we take Eric Hobsbawm, ironically a Marxist historian, take his, his famous expression, I think he didn't invent it, but he made it popular, of um, the short 20th century. L'histoire du cours, 20e siècle. It ends in 1991. So it was a long time ago, this 20th century. So what we have since then in terms of resistance uh, seems to be very much marginalized. If you think of world dominance by capitalism, it looks like a sort of monolithic figure striding into the future with a couple of flies buzzing around of terrorist attacks from time to time. But there's very little space outside the system from which to critique it. And so the, if you like, the 21st century seems to be from my point of view, not quite at the beginning of it, seems to be characterized by this very marginalized view of resistance, resistance outside. There's no alternative viable worldview. But Marxist theory has proved fertile in giving rise to other forms of thinking about power. So moving on from Marx himself, of course. And in particular, uh, Michel Foucault's theories, which were very influential in the late 20th century and are still important. And they're particularly challenging for the way we think about resistance within the humanities, resistance in the arts, because of his assertion that knowledge is inseparable from power. And he does, uses power slash knowledge as a way of showing that those two things are inseparable. And in this view, our way of thinking is determined by the discursive possibilities open to us at a given time. And it's a time that's historically defined and the way of thinking that we have at any moment is defined by the episteme. So it's, in a sense, it looks on the, on the surface as a way in which 
there's very little space for thinking outside that episteme. Um, from the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, we also have the term hegemony, which you've probably heard used all over the place. It was once used just to refer to the dominance of one state by another state, so a hegemonic state dominates another one. Gramsci uses it rather differently, and again in a way that's more relevant, thinking about resistance in the arts. He uses it to mean dominance by consent. So the power of hegemony lies in the fact that domination is not exerted by force, but by control over state apparatuses such as education, what we're doing here, and the media and all sorts of um, uh, institutions like that. So these ap state apparatuses represent the interests of the dominant class as if they were the common interest, so they dominate by consent. Now the influence of Foucault and Gramsci was crucial in the work of Edward Said. So I come back to my um, more personal narrative here because it's been very important in my own work. And in particular, his groundbreaking work, Orientalism of 1978, that you all know about, I'm sure. Uh, so when I found myself working at the intersection between 19th century studies and post-colonial theory, this is the work that you, you can't get around. It's sort of the beginning and the, um, it, it moves everything. It shifts the whole ground along. So the approach I took in my doctoral thesis way back when and afterwards was broadly situated in what you could call colonial discourse analysis. I mean, it was done before Said, but Said was the important, the marking figure in that field from 78 onwards. And, and colonial discourse analysis took on a lot of prestige in the wake of Orientalism. And at the time I was doing that work, there was also some really interesting work being done on stereotypes, which obviously is linked to colonial discourse analysis. So by people like Ruth Amosi and Mireille Rosello. So Said's conception of Orientalism as a discursive ensemble that predetermines the way we think about the Orient and Islam in particular has a lot in common with thinking about the stereotype as a sort of self-perpetuating, repeating device. And when I did my work for my thesis ages ago, I drew on a large number of texts that did basically perpetuate stereotypes. Um, a lot of them you would not have ever have heard of, probably, uh, fortunately so. So my first experience of research was actually unpicking these stereotypes, looking at how they worked. And there were stereotypes to do with racial difference, colonial relations, métissage was a particular theme I was interested in, and also gender relations. So a lot of those things that were um, part of the dominant discourse, the dominant episteme, and how they were repeated. But as I was reading and doing this research, I did from time to time come across texts that seemed to be doing something else all seem to be doing something else at the same time as just repeating stereotypes. So not just perpetuating them, but actually doing something more complicated as well. So the question that arises is, I think, can literary text, some literary texts, be seen as shaking the hegemonic view or shifting what Foucault calls the episteme? And in other words, is there space for resistance within literature or is literature fully determined by hegemony? hegemony? Does it just repeat stereotypes or does it actually move them on and change them? So the first approach that I took um, could be criticised for not allowing space for this resistance and shifting uh, nature, for being too Saidian, if you think, uh, although it wasn't all Edward Said's fault, of course. And Edward Said has been criticised um, for not allowing the possibility of resistance, uh, not allowing space for it within his uh, theoretical structure by people like Robert Young and Aziz Ahmad. So Said did attempt to include a concept of resistance. He was himself a political activist, of course, if you're a political activist, then you're kind of assuming that there's a possibility of resisting. But when he tried to theorize the idea of resistance, apart from just practicing it, which he did um, very effectively, his resistance, he sort of formulated in terms that have been seen as quite naively humanist. And he also went to some lengths to claim that the things that people were pointing out as theoretical inconsistencies in his approach were actually designed to allow what he called space for the determining imprint of individual writers. So it's coming back to a sort of humanist view of the individual as having uh, ability to change things and to make a difference. But it's quite difficult to reconcile this humanism with Said's approach to Orientalism as a discourse that draws on the, Foucault's, Foucault, the Foucauldian structuralist approach, which is basically an anti-humanist um, systemic approach. And in that approach, individuals don't have much control over the way epistemies are formed or changed. Uh, so it's, it's quite hard to see how these two things can fit together. And in particular, it's hard to see how you could find a position outside Orientalism as a discourse from which to talk about Islam without just repeating uh, stereotypes. And more broadly then, in terms of resistance in the arts, how do you find a position outside the hegemonic system 
from which to critique that hegemonic system. If it is hegemonic, how do you get outside it? So this is sounding a little bit gloomy, because it sounds like there's not much space. But what I want to argue, and what I do believe, is that it's possible to find space within the system um, and not necessarily entirely outside it. And in support for this, there is a lot of theoretical discussion of this, um, but I draw on critics like Robert Young again, Dennis Porter, who have argued that, in fact, although Said attempted to rework Foucault's theories by introducing a, an idea of humanist agency and individual uh, stance, that that's not necessary. What they argue is that if we go back to Foucault and Gramsci, the conception of discourse and hegemony uh, do actually include oppositional spaces and internal movement. So you don't actually get out of the system um, and in order to have that space. And in their view, opposition can arise not from individual agency, the humanist individual asserting him or herself, but in the form of shifting or contradictory discourses, so actually within the discursive system. And this, at first sight, does not seem possible within Said's Orientalism. It seems a bit too monolithic uh, for there to be this, this shifting pattern. So there are lots of different arguments for seeing hegemony as a constantly shifting process rather than a fixed state, and as fragmented and multiple rather than singular. And they've been developed, among others, by Raymond Williams, the late Stuart Hall, and Frederick Jameson, all in slightly different ways. I think it is, of course, uh, just as a word of caution, it's best not to overestimate the role of these sidelined, fragmentary voices of counter-discourse, and in particular in the area I work on, which is 19th century literature, um, that they are, they are sidelined. These voices are very much um, uh, moved, moved to one side. But um, there's a general viable lack of radical alternatives, so that what we've got is not, and they're not entirely radical alternative. And in thinking about this marginalization, I think it's interesting to draw on a distinction made by Ross Chambers. And he makes a distinction between revolutionary and oppositional texts. So revolutionary texts have an overt radical agenda, and they set out to change society. That's the kind of overt mission. But oppositional ta texts have um, uh, 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 work in a slightly different way. So if you read them through a light reading, then they seem to confirm the hegemonic view. But if you read them with a suspicious reading, then what's revealed is a hidden subversive agenda. So uh, my slightly in through the side door, modest introduction of these shifts then comes in through these oppositional texts and a suspicious reading of them. Now Said himself did again, come back to this, this issue and try to argue for uh, in what seems like a suspicious reading in Ross Chambers' terms. And he talked about a contrapuntal reading, um, a reading that will take account of both processes, that of imperialism and that of resistance to it. But Said relies in that reading on what's excluded from the text as much as what is included in the text. And you can imagine how that could lead to all sorts of potential problems. Um, but this idea of a contrapuntal reading is in some ways a bit like Ross Chambers' suspicious reading. And within literary studies proper, critical responses to Said have worked towards a version of Orientalism that's significantly nuanced since 1978 by heterogeneity and ambivalence. And um, that might include looking at the, the point of view of the speaker, so the different natures of speakers in gender difference, class difference within who's producing the discourse. But it also takes into account or argues for an approach that would look at literary texts as having a specific nature which is um, the ability to distance themselves from ideology by play, by um, a playing, mocking, uh, framing ideology. And that comes back to the suspicious reading, of course. So what I'm looking at is not revolutionary, but oppositional strategies within the dominant episteme. And that dominant episteme, in terms of um, my work, you could understand as the overarching discursive structure that constructs the non-European world as an unresisting space to be dominated intellectually and politically by European powers. So if that's the dominant epistemy, then there are other things going on um, which we need to um, unpick and find. So the literary text in particular can be read in multiple ways and in terms of play, ambivalence, and multidirectionality. And in this way, it can become oppositional in nature, and it can exploit the small cracks within the shifting hegemonic system. But that's not to say that all literary texts do this all the time. I do think the stereotypes are still there. And I think it's important to keep exploring how stereotypes function and um, how uh, dominant discourse repeats and reproduces itself, but at the same time as acknowledging that it's not just doing that. And this is where the painting with the fine brush comes in, because that was all very broad brush and theoretical. But of course, to look at the cracks in the system, you've got to come from the ground upwards, from close reading upwards. 
So I began uh, then with um, the book that Rebecca mentioned so kindly. Um, it was uh, Exotic Subversions, which I originally wanted to call um, Other Voices, but apparently it's been done too often. So in that book I argued that there was room for manoeuvre within 19th century exotic texts. And the argument in that book, because obviously there's room for manoeuvre in different ways, in that book I was relying, I was drawing on Mikhail Bakhtin's theories of dialogism and polyphony, and looking at linguistic difference and how um, authors included aspects of linguistic di difference, so effectively defamiliarizing or making strange their own uh, French language. And this was, uh, it really focused on romantic and late romantic or post-romantic writers. A modernist writer, Segalin included, but I think of him in, in some ways as being quite um, late romantic. And they were also texts that were in some ways marginalized or sidelined from the canon of the 19th century. So what I had, had done in that book was effectively to take a sidetrack around the dominant novels, the great, great tradition of the 19th century, which is the realist novel. So there's a certain logic in turning to that now, and the work I'm doing at the moment is on um, realism and late realism or naturalism. And I'm working on that on a book called The Colonial Comedy, which is going to be published with Oxford University Press. Um, and I like to think that the title is not the best thing about it, but I, I was very pleased by discovering this comedy, The Colonial Comedy title. So in that book, I'm looking at imperialism in the realist and naturalist novel. And um, so after a long preamble, I'm going to come to some examples of the fine brushwork after a bit more French formalism. And uh, look in particular at metonymy, as I've promised. Now, in looking at imperialism in the realist and naturalist novel, you might remember, of course, that most of the novels you can think of are set in Paris. Some of them are set in the provinces. And a lot of them focus on this Paris provinces um, access. So where are the colonies in the realist novel? And they're precisely off stage, usually, almost always. And so the way I'm looking at how they appear is indirectly. So characters leave, go to colonies, come back transformed, go there to die, inherit a fortune. And things come from the colonies, uh, objects. And they arrive into the space of, the Par of Paris or the provinces and circulate in that space. So it's, the, it's not so much the characters and movement that I'm looking at today, but the things themselves. Um, so the, the colonies are present in this offstage space. Now, as you know, the description of settings and inanimate objects is one of the most characteristic traits of the 19th century realist novel. And Balzac famously declares that you can't describe society without describing things. So you have to look at les hommes and les femmes, as well as um, the material representation of human thought, which is the objects that we surround ourselves with. So the material object is key to understanding the realist novel. And that realist novel itself has been seen, its rise has been seen as corresponding to the rise of the property middle classes. And Harry Levin reminds us that realism, etymologically, evokes thingism. So real, derived from the Latin race thing. So thingism is what realism is all about. So um, realist things, inanimate objects, convey meaning in particular ways. Usually they're not working as symbols for an invisible inner world, which is more a symbolist or romantic view of the, of the object. But they work predominantly through metonymy. And one theoretical definition of literary realism comes to us from Roman Jacobson. So he actually defines realism um, as having uh, metonymy as its mainstay and its characteristic emphasis on non-essential details. He says this is the defining nature of realism is the condensation of the narrative by means of images based on contiguity that is, avoidance of the normal designative term in favour of metonymy or synecdoche. And metonymy, I've got up there in case you've forgotten, is a figure of speech in which one word or phrase is substituted for another with which it is closely associated. So it works through association, whereas metaphor works through analogy, two things that aren't directly associated. So it's through the trope of metonymy, I would argue, that the novel points to the colonial comedy that's being played out across its, beyond its borders. But um, that's not to say that metaphor is not important too. And I'll look briefly at metaphor be before looking at some examples of colonial metonymy. Uh, so, so colonial metaphors. In, in the colonial novel, or in the realist novel, slavery is often used as a metaphor to describe class difference within Europe or the dominance of one gender over another. You've probably encountered metaphors like that quite often. And colonialism could be used as a metaphor for class difference again, for European internal politics, or individual psychological issues within one person or family. 
So this use of colonialism as a metaphor, and I haven't got onto metonymy yet, this is the metaphor bit, um, it risks reducing the real lived experience of non-European peoples to the status of mere analogy. They're just being used as a, a means to talk about something else. And Laura Chrisman, for example, argues that using slavery as an allegory, rather than treating it in its own right, effectively instrumentalizes it, subsuming it within metropolitan discourse. So it's another way of just marginalizing the issues of slavery. But I like to think that something else happens alongside this instrumentalization of the, the non-European um, other. And that is suggested by Susan Mayer and Benita Paru. So if there's a careless equivalence between gender and, or class domination and imperialism, that does risk emptying out the specificity of slavery and race, kind of reducing it to nothing. But Mayer argues that the full signification of the vehicle of meta remains present at the margins of our consciousness as we perceive metaphors. So just to remind you that metaphor, the two parts of it, vehicle and tenor, the vehicle is the thing that you're evoking and the tenor is the thing that you're sort of pointing it at. So the slave might be used as a vehicle for, to talk about a white woman. The, the point is the white woman. So Mayer's argument there is that rather than, it does effectively instrumentalize slavery to use slavery in this way, but there's something else that happens as well because the yoking of the two terms produces some suggestion in the text of the exploited or vulnerable situation of the people or race or the slavery, the condition of slavery. So that in, it's sort of indirectly within the metaphor, this consciousness is brought into the text. And part of the energy of metaphor, she claims, comes from a marginal awareness of what remains dissonant between its two terms. And so one result is that colonized people and racial difference, if used as a vehicle of a metaphor, do push back into the novel and make their presence felt. Benita Parry agrees in seeing the use of race as metaphor as justified on the grounds that this transference opens the door to the way the history of British colonialism, which is what she's talking about, finds its way into the fictions. So colonialism and slavery do come in um, despite being marginalized in this way. So this is why I turn to metonymy, which I think is a, as a more open trope than metaphor. Metonymy also opens a side door through which the history of colonialism enters metropolitan fiction. And because it's a more open trope than metaphor, um, I think it does this in more, very interesting ways. So in metaphor, if you think of metaphor as an analogy between a vehicle and a tenor, it's a relatively, I wouldn't say single uh, linear relationship, but it's a more simple relationship. Metonymy works through contiguity or association, and so it can head off in different directions at the same time, because you can associate one thing with lots of other things, can't you? Uh, so I like to think that metonymy then, um, because it works in this multi-directional way, can open up text's political implications. So to give you an example, if you were to read Zola's work in an overtly political way, people have tended to focus on the workings of metaphor or even allegory. So you might remember the famous endings of La Bête Humaine or Nana, um, where the situation of the train rushing off into the future or the courtesan's body rotting, these are basically working as allegories for the decline of the Second Empire. So that is a political reading that is based on metaphor. But it's quite a, a single track one, although the fact that using the word track reminds me that, of course, the train tracks do head off metonymically, metonymically in other ways. This reading of the realist novel belies the fact that there is this enormous wealth in realism and naturalism in detail, insignificant, apparently non-essential details. And I'd like to say then that through the trope of metonymy, what happens is we can have alternative political readings um, that head off in different directions. So multi-directional metonymy um, and this sort of overflowing presence of things in the novel um, is the principal means by which the novel, the realist novel, incorporates the realities of the wider world into the metropolis. So material colonial objects have inspired critical attention recently, mainly focusing on British culture. And this has been part of a general interest in the everyday and material culture that's partly inspired by cultural studies. And in particular, uses uh, a term coined by Bill Brown in 2001, which is thing theory. So we've had thingism, now we've got thing theory. And I particularly like the work of Elaine Friedgood in a book called The Ideas in Things that works on British culture. She invokes uh, the idea of splitting within the novel, which she takes from Pierre Macheret. And this idea of splitting is a way in which objects point to the play of history beyond the edges of the novel, encroaching on those edges. And she calls for a strong literalizing or materializing metonymic reading rather than a standard weak reading in which an object just tells us something about a character or a subject. <laughs> 
So uh, the object can actually tell us all sorts of things about the material context as well. So by putting the object back into its material context, we reinstate it within multiple meanings. It has a subversive ability to disrupt meaning, um, and to be endlessly vagrant. This is Elaine Freed good again. And it can recuperate historical links that are anything but random. So it is through this density of realist writing, realist description in particular, with all these details that at first reading might seem unnecessary, that is the way that the realist mode brings in history in this very compelling and broad way. And it is this um, density of description that also makes gaps uh, particularly striking. And if you're going to be describing everything, then why are you leaving certain things out? I haven't done that much work on where the gaps are. I'm actually focusing on real objects, objects that are actually evoked. But there are interesting things to be done with gaps. So my argument is that metonymy, more than metaphor, brings colonialism in and history in by the side door. But a single object can function as both metonymy and metaphor. And I will occasionally mention synecdoche, which of course is where the part stands for the whole. I must admit it's not always entirely clear to me where you draw the line between metonymy, association, and synecdoche, where the part stands for the whole. So it sort of depends on how you're defining the part and the whole. Um, but maybe you'll have some views on whether that distinction is significant or not. So I'm going to suggest what this can mean for how we read metropolitan texts by looking at a few specific examples um, rather rapidly. My first example is taken from Eugénie Grandet, in which Balzac brings in the wider world in several ways. So most obviously, Charles Grandet, who Eugénie is in love with, heads off and becomes a slave trader in order to make up his lost family fortune. And in the process of trading in slaves, he loses any gentleness or sincere emotion that he once had, and he becomes hardened and dehumanized. And the slave trade also stands then as a metaphor for the buying and selling of men and women um, in general, even within um, metropolitan society, in particular by Eugenie's father, Grandet, the miser, but by other people as well. Um, and there's a long series of mentions of sugar and the reminder that it's a colonial object, it's a colonial um, import. Uh, more briefly, there's an evocation that I'm going to look at here, which is uh, of Eugenie's personal treasure, her douzaine de mariage. So it's made up of individual coins given to her by her father that she's um, collected. And these coins are made of gold, and they are stamped by the various colonial powers. Balzac lists them in great detail. Portugal, Genoa, Spain, Holland. And what I want to point out briefly now is that um, these coins operate through different tropes and in different directions. So they operate as synecdoche, this is the part for the whole again. So as being a little collection of coins, they stand for the whole collection of coins, which is her father's hoarding. And of course, it's a story about a miser. They operate through metaphor because they're described as vierge and pure, so they're pure gold and they're virgin gold. And they stand therefore as metaphor for Eugenie's own virginity and purity. But they also operate as metonymy. And in, because they are coins from the slave trading nations that have come from this sort of colonial um, uh, history, uh, they, by their association, they evoke the slave trade that um, Charles Grandet is engaging in. And effectively, they therefore remind us of the slave trade's dehumanizing effects, which are flagged up elsewhere in the novel. So they point outwards from this narrow provincial setting of Saumur, through metonymy, to a vast geographical and political network, and one in which human values are denied by the slave trade. That's something that Balzac reminds us of explicitly, but the coins remind us of that less explicitly. So it is, uh, the, the specific reading of these coins is grounded in other references in the novel, but the, the coins themselves work as um, synecdoche, metaphor, and metonymy. My second example is taken from L'Education Sentimentale, and it concerns something that Flaubert mentions a few times, um, the two grandes statuettes polychromes représentant des nègres. And these are statues that Louise Roque asks Frédéric to buy for her from Arnoux's shop. So bring your memories back to L'Education Sentimentale. Um, so they're, they're, there's a sort of pursuit of these objects. And the reason why she wants them is because she's seen similar ones in the height of provincial elegance, the Prefecture de Troyes, the Troyes being a very small provincial town, the Prefecture, I can imagine, is actually fairly bourgeois, um, but that's what she aspires to. So these statues stand metonymically for the whole project of Monsieur Arnoux, in whose shop they're being sold, um, and his project, in its various forms, is linked to l'art industriel, the idea that um, the work of art can now be reproduced, mass-produced, um, and produced in a sort of industrial way. And this is linked to Flaubert's denunciation of the degraded position of the work of art in the age of industrialization, and also to his um, recurrent theme of the repetition of stereotypes. Because obviously, if you're going to reproduce a work of art uh, identically, more or less, 
you're doing the same thing as reproducing the idée reçue, which is one of Flaubert's great um, bugbears. So these particular statues of Negroes also, I think, work through synecdoche. At least I think it's synecdoche as well. You know, is it metonymy or synecdoche? Because they stand for Louise Roch's desire to imitate the higher classes, or what she imagines to be the lifestyle of the higher classes. She might have got this wrong, of course. And in her case, that, as I said, that's the provincial elite of Troyes. But what I'd like to say then is that this desire to imitate is happening at two levels. Because why does the, the wife of the préfet de Troyes have two large statues of, painted statues of Negro slaves in her house? What are they doing there? So I think we're back to metonymy here. And um, effectively what's happening is that the aspiring middle classes of the 1840s are um, evoking a sort of lost Never Neverland, an idyllic view of a past in which there was slavery. So it's a sort of version of the Ancien Régime in which the necessity of work, work by myself, of course, not by other people, is removed because one has this magical function of um, slavery. So it's a sort of magical Never Neverland of slavery, which I call sinister pastoral because it often involves an imagined view of this great lifestyle, you're lying, lying back, you know, smoking a cigar and watching the slaves um, gathering in the cotton. It's a nostalgic theme, this sinister pastoral, nostalgic for something that never happened. And it haunts the whole of the 19th century. It comes up in all over the place in really surprising ways. In Le Père Goriot, for example, Vautrin dreams of going off to America. And his dream of going to America is to have a slave holding um, in which he won't have to work. Uh, so that's this, it's this, I think, uh, angst, the necessity for work in an increasingly democratic society um, that creates the counter-fantasy of sinister pastoral in which you'd be able to head off to this fantasy America or a pre, a sort of golden age slave owning past. So it's an escape from the banal bourgeois world of work. And, and oddly enough, of course, America stands as a metaphor. We might think of America as standing for democracy, but in a lot of these texts, when um, slavery or America uh, come up as themes, they stand for the freedom of the individual, the individual who's alienated by modernity in France, but that freedom is somehow reconquered by depriving other people of their freedom, and that's the, sort of the basis of what America stands for in a lot of these novels, surprisingly enough. But what's interesting for me at any rate, and I can't develop that fully here, is that in uh, Balzac, and particularly in Flaubert, this aspiration to a sort of colonial never-neverland is actually being um, satirized. It's being held up as not possible. It's being shown to be false and fake. And uh, just as a sort of aside, um, Bakhtin talks about the colonies. Well, he doesn't talk about the colonies. He talks about pastoral as a mode without actually extending it to the colonies. And pastoral is an idyllic mode, a model for restoring folkloric time. And I think the colonies function in the 19th century as a, as a way of restoring this imagined folkloric time. Um, and for the 19th century novel, of course, the colonies, using the colonies in this way, has a distinct advantage over using a kind of utopia. A utopia doesn't exist, and the colonies do exist. So of course, if we can situate this imagined pastoral land in the place that does exist, we can pretend to be realist to some extent. So the utopian and pastoral imagination that in previous eras might have been situated in ancient Greece or something is being situated in the colonies uh, by European fantasy. And it's linked to the, I don't know if anyone is interested in finding another research topic, was interested, in, influenced by the early 19th century writer Fenimore Cooper, who was translated into French, and had an enormous impact. And they're frontier novels, the pioneer novels, as it's part of this new pastoral imagination. But as I said, Balzac and Flaubert in particular are showing this fantasy to be preposterous. My third example is also from L'Education Sentimentale. And it concerns a strange object that Madame Arnoux wears in her hair at a dinner party. Dans les cheveux, une longue bourse algérienne en filet de soie rouge. I couldn't find an image of what uh, wearing an Algerian purse in your hair might look like. Um, but I do realize from having Googled it quite a lot that women wore all sorts of odd things in their hair in the 1840s. So this is a sort of random example of a, an 1840 hairdo. Um, and this, this um, Algerian red silk purse sort of hangs over the side and dangles down in quite a phallic way over her shoulder. So it works in all sorts of different ways, this um, red silk purse. It works as a metaphor. So red silk suggests repressed sensuality and passion. And the fact that it's a purse, of course, suggests that even she might be available for the right price at the right time. Um, so she stands for sort of ideal love, but actually she's wearing this purse in her hair. So we should be doubting that. And bourse is also slang for testicles, but that's something I don't have time to go into right now. So gender studies angle on that one, maybe. 
uh, Flaubert's correspondence is so full of dirty language that when you pick up on it in his novels, it's hardly surprising. But the exotic headdress also stands as um, synecdoche for the Anu couple's exotic pose in general. So they both have, they collect these exotic objects, they decorate their apartments in an exotic way. And Anu wears exotic clothes. And metonymically, so we're situating the novels in the 1840s, and of course we've got lots of dinner conversations and political chat going on. But the headdress in that context points to the French conquest of Algeria, which of course was began in 1830, but a lot of the, blood, uh, the bloodiest battles were in the 1840s. So it's happening as the novel is set. And in particular, Arnoux, um, that's Monsieur Arnoux, is identified with a false exoticism that makes him seem dated, because it echoes the July monarchy's own attempt at self-publicity. The July monarchy was using the conquest of Algeria as a way of distracting things from metropolitan politics, and also as a way of um, looking quite grand and bringing in um, apparent victories. The Algerian theme also potentially identifies Arnoux and the liberal bourgeoisie from which he emerges with the defeated Arabs. So um, the military leaders that are brought in to put down the 1848 coup, um, the, the put down the revolutionary masses in 1848, those military re leaders have been brought in straight from um, Algeria, where they've learned new techniques of violence to contain uh, civilian unrest, a sort of ultra-violence um, that wasn't actually the norm in use against civilian populations before then. So you might at this point be thinking, aren't all these metonymical pointers to the wider world rather marginal and insignificant in terms of what's going on in the realist novel? Because they're basically metropolitan, talking about metropolitan things. So in um, uh, my last example, I want to um, suggest that the bringing these things in indirectly is actually very, very important. And this indirect evocation through metonymy is a way of sort of counteracting a silencing of colonial history that happens in the metropolitan novel otherwise. So this example is taken from Balzac's novella, Gobsek. And um, it was in 1830 that he began it. There's a first version called L'Usurier, and it was a couple of years, three years before writing Eugénie Grandet. So it's sort of part of the same sort of thinking about L'Usurier. He later developed it as a longer tale in 1835, and then in 1842, um, the full tale that we have as Gobsek now. And when he was revising uh, the tale for the 1835 version, Balzac introduced a colonial theme. And it was associated with the early experiences and seedy death of the character, the eponymous character, Gobsek. So Gobsek uh, made his fortune initially in 20 years trading on the high seas between India and the Caribbean, the East and West Indies. And he made money through buying and selling slaves and state secrets and some dodgy things that we don't quite know what they are and he doesn't want to talk about them, understandably. So like Charles Grandet in Eugénie Grandet, Gobsek loses his integrity and any sense of absolute moral values through the practice of the slave trade. And in many ways he is much more successful than Grandet fils. When we encounter him in the tale, this is a, long, a, lot, a lot of time later, and he's had a whole career in Paris, and the tale is very much based in Paris. It doesn't deal with his earlier life directly. But he builds up a second colonial fortune, this time in Paris. And the tale, in this way, builds with an issue on which French literature has remained remarkably taciturn, in what Christopher Miller has called a calculated plan for forgetting about the Haitian Revolution. And Charles, of course, knows much more about the Haitian Revolution than I do, but... Um, uh, also about the silencing of the, the Haitian Revolution. And this silencing of the memory of the Haitian Revolution by history was denounced resoundingly by the historian Michel Rolf uh, Trouillot in his 1995 book, Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History. So it's obviously linked to our title about power and resistance. So the Young Republic of Haiti, which had been called Saint-Domingue up to then, won its independence from France, in fact, but not yet legally, um, in the world's first successful slave revolution, 1791 to 1804. And in 1825, it was at last recognized, so its independent existence was recognized by France, in exchange for an indemnity of 150 million gold francs, which were intended to reimburse the ex-slaveholders for the cost of their slaves. So this amount was 10 times Haiti's annual revenue, and the agreement was that it was to be raised by the Republic of Haiti taking out uh, loans, and the loans had to be taken out by Parisian banks. So you just think that through a little bit and it makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. But anyway, Haiti continued to pay make payments to France until I think it's 1947, um, and it remained crippled by foreign debt, but I think there was a debt waiver in 2010, uh, so that it was a bit of a contentious, uh, and there was a whole argument about whether France should actually pay back the amount of money that Haiti had paid to it 
um, because the whole idea of owning slaves was uh, preposterous and illegal in any case. So in Balzac's tale, Gobsek is on the committee that distributes the indemnity to individual claimants. And what he receives are the bénéfices, cadeaux, or présents, in other words, bribes, from the claimants. So he makes a fortune from Haitian debt slavery. But his fortune doesn't turn out to be a magical means of self-realization. And when he dies, his apartment is full of these heaps of decomposing merchandise. It's crawling with worms and insects. And in the merchandise, most of it is colonial in nature. So des caisses de thé, des balles de café, marchandises consignées en son nom au Havre, balles de coton, boucaux de sucre, tonneaux de rhum, café, indigo, tabac, tout un bazar de denrées coloniales. So all these objects that are imported from the colonies um, that have come his way as um, non-monetary presents. Of course, the problem is that he didn't sell them on. He should have sold them and made the money. And it's about his miserliness as well. So here's a whole series of metonymies um, that work uh, as metonymy for a new form of colonial, neo-colonial exploitation. Neo-colonial because, of course, it's uh, sort of debt harvesting rather than actual direct domination. Um, and they work as metaphor at the same time for the sterile and wasteful nature of the miser's hoarding and his loveless, heartless lifestyle. So this is not a denunciation of slavery um, or of neo-colonialist exploitation. In fact, Balzac um, very explicitly did not denounce slavery. Um, in his letters. But it is a long way from evoking the distant colonies as a way to consolidate metropolitan order. And if that sounds preposterous, it is argued by Edward Said in his famous essay on Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. We'll come back to Jane Austen. And his argument is that um, the consolidation of metropolitan order is the aim, and that the, so the return to domestic harmony follows the return to productivity and regulated discipline in the Antiguan slave holdings of the owner of Mansfield Park, Sir Thomas. So that it's only by asserting order in the colonies that order can be brought back into the metropolis. So what we've got in Gobsek is a long way from that. Basically, it's disorder, it's sort of like a vision of entropy, you know, all these piled up heaps of things, random colonial merchandise that's actually rotting before our eyes. Um, so there's something more going on than just the reassertion of order. So that was my last specific example, but I want to, um, before I conclude, go on very briefly, if I've got time, to just the last section, to suggest that colonial metonymy of the kind that I've evoked actually introduces a strain into the signifying mode of realism itself. Um, so internal strains in the realist mode. So I've argued that colonial metonymy brings in historical links with extra metropolitan realities. And now I'm going to say that it actually introduces a strain into how realism itself functions. So metonymy is a central trope of realism, as Jacobson argues, and that is generally understood by reference to contiguity. And contiguity is derived from the Latin contiguous, which means touching. So this actually introduces a metaphor. In our definition of metonymy depends on a metaphor. It's, it's a little bit confusing, but that's the way it works. And in that metaphor, spatial proximity, so touching, contiguity, stands for conceptual proximity or association. So this spatial metaphor underlies the way in which we think of metonymic chains as operating. So the classic example of metonymy that's probably given in all your um, undergraduate lectures and lots of handbooks is um, from the beginning of Le Père Goriot, when you have a long description of the pension Vauquet, the boarding house, you have a description of Madame Vauquet, the owner of the boarding house, and we have a description of her greasy petticoat with the wadding hanging out. And Balzac tells us explicitly, being Balzac he likes to make it explicit, the petticoat stands for her as she stands for the boarding house. So that's a chain of association working through contiguity or metonymity. Um, so the, the problem when we have colonial uh, met metonymy is that introducing a colonial object or a proper name or a reference during a conversation creates a rupture between conceptual continuity, conceptual association and spatial contiguity. So if you have an object imported from Morocco, it's associated conceptually with Morocco, but it's spatially circulating in metropolitan Paris. Of course, we're used to some kind of splitting, spatial splitting in the French novel, because we've, we're constantly going back to that opposition between Paris and the provinces. That's a, a recurrent theme. But in, in the case of the colonies, we've got a much bigger gap, a big spatial gap, and there's a kind of hiatus. It's quite hard to leap over that bridge. So colonial and exotic objects retain a sort of awkwardness resulting from this rupture of spatial contiguity. And colonial metonymy is an uneasy presence in the narrow, um, claustrophobic, sort of over-determined world of metropolitan realism, 
This awkwardness is often exploited deliberately by writers in order to question the limitations of the realist mode that they are working with. So contiguity is association and contiguity are one of the major modes of um, realism. And the other important aspect of realism that I want to evoke is vraisemblance, very similitude. So realism works by um, convincing us that we're in a familiar world. And of course, in Barthes' famous essay on the effet de réel, some realist description has no function except to reassure us that we're in the world we know. There might be an object described that's just there to say, hi, this is the real world. That's his effet de réel. So it signals verisimilitude or familiarity. But of course, the effet d'exotisme, which Barthes doesn't talk about, um, is actually does the opposite, because it brings in an object whose main function is to signal that it comes from somewhere else, that it's not familiar, that it is um, in vraisem invraisemblable. Uh, so um, the effet d'exotisme is used in a surprising number of realist novels. So we're not just doing the effet de réel. And oriental objects are the most frequent examples of this effet d'exotisme. And I think this is partly because orientalism, orientalism poses a particularly acute set of problems for realism. So there's one of the canonic texts of Orientalism is Hugo's Les Orientales in 1829, and he has a preface in which he lays out a manifesto for a certain type of um, use of the Orient. And what he wants is the Orient to be used as an anti-figurative space. So that the Orient is not referential, not figurative. And this is taken up by the art for art's sake um, movement later on. Oscar Wilde also argued that the history of the decorative arts is the record of the struggle between Orientalism with its frank rejection of imitation, its love of artistic convention, its dislike of the actual representation of any object in nature, and our own imitative spirit. So the imitative spirit, of course, being essential to realism. And he sees Orientalism as one way of escaping what he calls, in a wonderful phrase, the prison house of realism. So if you are going to have a realist text with an oriental object in it, um, as a sort of motif, it uh, is associated with a rejection of the imitative aspect of the referential function. And it also stands potentially as in a relation of substitution for an absent original because it's looking at something that's not there, a whole country that's not there. Sulivas Aravamudan uh, sees exoticism as a poetics of the object that is not just about acquiring or so collecting objects, but a dynamic process of making and framing. And in the painting that I've got up here by Alfred Stevens, it's called Land à Paris. Um, on one level, what we're being shown is just a young woman in a sort of very discreet bourgeois dress, um, dove grey silk probably, among exotic carpets, screen, and uh, the exotic hublot, which is the Indian imported object. And I quite like the contrast between the new grey of her very tasteful Parisian dress and the, um, the sort of exotic colours. But I'd argue that what we're also being shown um, is the bourgeois gaze on the exotic collector's object, so her gaze on the object. And that this sets up a parallel between the spectator's gaze on her and her gaze on the object. So what happens is, because we're doubling this gaze, is uh, what we're looking at is the process of objectification itself. Objectification of her and her objectification of the object. Uh, so Ayurveda Mudan suggests that by introducing strangeness and the foreign into the realist aesthetic, exoticism anticipates Bertolt Brecht's defamiliarization or alienation effect, the Verfremdungs effect. Um, and he, he does acknowledge that this is often done um, with a politically conservative intention. And I think that's the case of Alfred Stevens' painting, so I'm not claiming that it's absolutely revolutionary. But it does uh, push us to look at the gaze, the collector's gaze, as well as just doing the collecting. The effet d'exotism is arguably more apparent in, in France and French literature than in Britain. Because in Britain, there's a certain um, everydayness or taken for grantedness about the empire. It's much more common to have reference to the empire. In French literature and painting, it's still a little bit unusual. And so the introduction of imperial objects or motifs is flagged up as being problematic in some way by the realist novel. So what I'm saying then is that realist novel writers actually employ exotic objects and names as a way of making the reality of things seem less than straightforward. So this effet d'exotisme actually counteracts the effet de réel and the verisimilitude of the effet de réel. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you today about um, resistance with a capital R and oppositionality with a small o. Um, and um, I hope I've argued my case for metonymy as a way of uh, looking at the multiple meanings, bringing in the broader world and um, looking at thingism in the realist novel. Thank you.
here, but um, we see that as kind of foreignization in terms of disrupting maybe what the reader is expecting, or did it become so much of a tradition that maybe that was to be expected and so we didn't really have that kind of effect? I think there's a, a transition. So in Flaubert, for example, um, the exotic objects are clearly so familiar that they are already sort of worn out. They've already become cliches in themselves. So whereas earlier in the 1830s, uh, an exotic object is exotic, sort of au premier degré, by the time Flaubert's writing in 1869, by then, by the second half of the century, exoticism is being flagged up as being kind of jaded and second-hand. So they're actually looking at... Uh, um, uh, they're looking at or Orientalism in particular critically by that time. So it, it would sort of depend on, on where you are. But I don't know that it, I wouldn't, I'm not sure about using the word foreign, foreignization, saying from trans translation studies, um, because that's specifically applied to language. And it does happen as well, that the two sort of things that happen together, sometimes in the same work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, um, would you say it's kind of used as a strategy for representing you know, the people of Oriental cultures? The people are ba barely ever get a mention. I mean, in the, in the works that I worked on for my um, thesis, which was looking at colonial literature, there was a lot on the actual colonized peoples, um, usually in terms that one hesitates to reproduce because they're so awful. Um, but in the realist text, it's very, very unusual. So sometimes metaphors are used, metaphors drawn from colonial peoples are used to describe metropolitan people, so the class difference typically. Um, uh, the lower classes described in terms that are borrowed from colonial language. Uh, it's a slightly less palatable part of what I'm doing. Because <laughs> it's often they're, they're using the metaphor of racial difference and importing it wholesale um, to apply to the dangerous classes. Um, but the actual colonized peoples, no, they don't really get much of a say. So. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I do have a question um, for your example with Madame Kamu's Algerian headdress. Yeah. So I'm wondering about um, Flaubert's travel himself in Egypt, and of course his writing about um, the courtesan Kuju Kanam mm -hmm. in the travel writing and his correspondence, and how that would fit in here with mm -hmm. um, your scheme of metaphor synecdoche. Yeah, I've actually written a whole article on this. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> um, so how does it fit in? Um, um, and especially, and especially yeah. since I think the last line of the Newcastle Something Not Dead sort of evokes the Turkish bath. Um, yes. Right? With yeah. Um, yeah. La Turque, yeah. the Maison Basse. Um, I think part of the answer is that Flaubert is thumbing his nose at us because he liked to include jokes at several levels. And there are references um, in uh, L'Education Sentimentale to the Voyage en Orient and to Maxime Ducamp's version of the Voyage en Orient um, and to Flaubert's previous or Oriental novel, Salambo. Uh, so there's sort of references that wouldn't be picked up by most readers. I think the references to Salambo would have been picked up at the time because Salambo had had quite a big impact. Um, but, but some of those things are actually sort of coded in to the text in ways that seem almost deliberately perverse, um, as if he were pulling Maxime Ducamp's leg or something. So that's not to reduce it all to a personal joke, but I think there is a little bit of that going on. So there are parallels between descriptions of Madame Amou and this courtesan in Egypt. And it's interesting, because I don't know how many of you know the novel, um, I'm obsessed by this novel, so I could go on for too long about it. But when uh, Frédéric sees Madame Anou, he sees her in this very idealized light. And yet within, if you look at the text closely, there are all sorts of parallels between the way she's described and the way this Egyptian courtesan is described in Flaubert's travel writings, which detracts somewhat from the idealization of her as an unattainable object. Um, so I think from the outset, we should be reading her as not unattainable. It's, it, it, was an, it was contingent, it was just a kind of random thing. They, they would have had sex, but something happened. A revolution, a child got sick, you know, random things that happen. And so her, um, the idealization of her as a sort of unattainable beauty is unpicked by the Egyptian theme. Um, but that's, uh, that's in the article that Rebecca mentioned, um, um, the apparition. Because, you know, commune apparition is how she's presented immediately in the first sight of her. And the Algerian purse has been neglected 
Um, so I looked at, I think, five different English translations of that scene, and they just don't know how to deal with it. Because the idea of having a purse in your hair is so weird. So it's described, it's translated as a snood, um, or um, uh, a headdress, but the people seem very reluctant to actually put the word bourse, and it is a, a purse. And he mentions it in his letters as well. So. In um, Flaubert's description of Kuchu Kanan, he uses all this exotism mm. to delineate how she is precisely an exotic courtesan, not the yeah. courtesan he would frequent in Paris. And so that sort of detail that sticks out and refuses to be translated seems to be sort of both in the novel or in the scene that you're talking about, but also in the travel description. Yes. Like the scarf. Um, that so Kuchu Kanam dances, the right. dance of the belly with this striped scarf that Flaubert then wishes he'd collected and brought back with him in a very fetishistic kind of way. And the scarf appears in Le Duc de saint -Matelas. So there are, there's a sort of, I think he's deliberately using that text, partly perhaps to distance himself from it, because uh, that was his own younger self in the 1840s. And the novel's set in the 1840s, and he's writing it in 1869. So there's a sort of self satirization going on but I think he's having a go at a few other people as well. <laughs> you mentioned briefly about the role of gender in the stereotyping in the colonial imaginary. Could you elaborate? Do you mean back in the colonial texts? Uh, yes, in the oh. colonial texts. Ooh, where do I start? I mean, the work I did was on, um, on portrayal of women in um, those texts. So it had to be uh, relatively focused. And there's been some really interesting work done on the adventure novel from the same period I looked at by uh, Jean-Marie Seillon. And that, I think, is looking at a different set of texts. So adventure novel tends to be kind of boys' own stories. And I was looking at um, a large number of texts that basically were about a Frenchman going to the colonies, um, having an affair with a native woman, and then it doesn't work for various reasons. And usually they fail to have a child for various reasons. And she usually betrays him. And a, a lot of the, the, the gender and race was very sort of tightly enmeshed because the, in order to find her attractive, she has to be less alien than the others. So there's a lot of, sort of comparative race, racism going on. So everyone else is absolutely horrible because of these things. But she's not because so the shape of her nose and eyes and the, the facial angle that people looked at and the color of her skin, and all these traits will be slightly less um, other, um, which make her somehow acceptable, but then sometimes when she betrays him, they come back. She'll suddenly be black again. You know? So it's, uh, I think it was interesting to look at how race was subject to gender relations and shifted. Perceptions of race were completely, even within the novel, were portrayed as shifting. So I got back onto race there from gender, didn't I? But I think, um, yeah, the, the, the idea that, that race was a construct and determined by these gender relations is partly coming from. Thanks a lot for that. Okay. Um, just to pick up on when you talk about his, just historicization of the objects and the way in which the second half of the 19th century, the attitude towards exotic objects evolves. I, I, I'd be really interested to hear more about the way in which these, these operate as a vehicle of exoticism, because you almost got a, got a spectrum there, because I think a lot of the objects you're talking about are pretty domesticated. Mm. And they've been produced for, for domestic consumption. A lot of them are made in Paris, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and I suppose, and then this, the Gosbeck example I think is absolutely fascinating. Do, do you still, do you have examples though that are sort of radically other and sort of betoken and, and quite disruptive of our territory? Um, which I think would probably mm. be in slightly different ways, wouldn't it? Mm. Uh, the, the, the other question is around thing, thing theory. Um, yeah. what, what's new about it? when you distinguish it, what, what distinguishes it from new historicism from yeah. certain strands of um, deconstruction which led to Saeed and counterpoint? Yes. So that's no, so just to... Yeah. I, I think that the, for the object to be um, completely disruptive, mm -hmm. you've got to look earlier at texts, actually from quite canonical texts like Balzac's Pour de Chagrin, where um, the, the object has some kind of really disturbing meaning in itself. Uh, and it is 
very closely linked to its exotic origins. Because, of course, by the time you get to Flaubert, um, he's uh, holding up the object as sort of claiming to have meaning, but not having meaning. He, what he's showing us is that it doesn't have meaning. So the, the idea of a really disruptive alterity, you can't, you can't have it, can't be there anymore in Flaubert. Um, and even in Salambo, the, the object that seems to be disruptively really um, important and significant turns out not to be. It, it's just a mantle. It, it, he looks like it stands for the goddess and all absolute meaning, but it doesn't. And that, that sort of leeching out of meaning is a very Flaubertian trait. And it actually does happen in Maupassant Zola as well. But in um, Balzac, so in the 1830s, uh, objects do have meaning and therefore could be attached to real difference, uh, but they're less realistic objects in that sense, less specifically colonial and more exotic. So, I mean, there may be such things, but in the, the sort of canon, the Balzac, Flaubert, Zola, Maupassant line, not so much. And the other thing about thing theory, I do wonder that, because it gets getting up and down or getting all excited about how important things are and claiming that's something new. I mean, people have been claiming things are really important for a long time. Uh, Balzac does it in the avant propos of the Comédie Humaine. Uh, so what's different about the so-called thing turn uh, or the objective turn to objects? You know, in what sense is that actually new? I think what... Um, I like Elaine Friedgood's work, because what she does very carefully is look at the material context. So it is a sort of new historicist approach, because looking at the historical, always historicize and all that. Um, but she, she, it's sort of an angle on that in which she's going to look at the, um, the economic history of an object, um, like imported cashmere shawls or something. And what was the significance of that between literary texts and materialism? So it is, it is possibly a way of bringing materialism in, that new historicism did, but I think it's doing more of the same. But I think, yes, it's a bit exaggerated to say it was invented in 2001. People have been talking about things longer than that, because they're quite important. <laughs> so it's just a slightly different... I guess jumping up and down about it is quite important. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I think the Nouveau Gourmand is so um, obsessed by attacking Balzac and the model of significant objects that it focuses on objects as no, not significant. Well, I think it's annoying that they're just missing the present result. Yeah. That they have a different yeah. signification then, which is lack of, more of a than signification, yeah. lack of signification. But I don't think that they're um, um, as historically grand. Because the great thing about Balzac, of course, is that although he had these appalling beliefs himself, he brings in, he's so um, interested in how the world works that he does bring in the bigger picture, despite, um, I mean, he actually defends slavery in his letters, so he's not an abolitionist by any means. Um, but he, his, his works show us slavery functioning in an extremely negative and destructive way, uh, but that's not what he said. Thank you.